Now to the polling question before I introduce our moderator. The polling question is, do you know of a recent multiracial, multigenerational coalition that has been successful? One for yes, two for no. And while you're voting, it's my honor to introduce you to Gail Christopher, the Vice President and Senior Advisor for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Gail, in her capacity as the Vice President and Senior Advisor, Gail helps the foundation achieve its mission to support children, families, and communities in creating and strengthening the condition in which vulnerable children can succeed. Gail joined the foundation in 2007 and led the foundation's community leadership network. Under her leadership, the foundation launched its America's Healing Initiative in 2010, and she was recently named Vice President of the Kellogg Foundation's Unprecedented Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Enterprise, which will help communities embrace racial healing and uproot conscious and unconscious beliefs in the hierarchy of human value. Ladies and gentlemen, Gail Christopher. Thank you very much. And we have the distinct honor of being the last panel of the day. So we're going to try and energize and engage you. It has been an amazing experience to be here, to listen to all the insights as, as our panel comes on board. And I, I will introduce them momentarily. But I wanted to say that the depth of the conversation here today, the, the variety, the insight, the inclusiveness, they just mark a very important model for us as we go forward. And I just wanted to applaud those who organized and brought us together. So let's give a hand. We have a very impressive panel that probably needs no introduction to many of you, but I'm going to briefly introduce them. Uh, we have Mimoa, President and Executive Director of the Asian American Advancing Justice Organization, Mimoa. We have Malika Sada Zar, Public Policy and Government Relations Senior Counsel, Civil and Human Rights for Google. And I understand Google gets more eyeballs than any other company. Is that, is that true? I think so. Absolutely. We have Jonathan Likes, Coordinating Council Member for BYP 100, Black Youth Project 100. Excellent. And we have, yes, absolutely. And we have someone who needs no introduction to all of us. We have Wade Henderson, President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Welcome, Wade Henderson. As, as has been characteristic all day, you see a multi-generational and an inclusive panel. Wade and I, we bring up the, the, the long, <laughs> in terms of the generational perspective. And we have multiple points of view. And, and that's really part of the challenge we face going forward. This panel is talking about tomorrow's urban civil rights coalition. Now, there's some debate as to whether the idea of a coalition is, is old school. I just, and you know, today's definition is more about network than it is about coalition. I looked up definitions of coalition, and it's when a group of people come together, usually temporarily, to achieve a common purpose. So we don't really, I think that that's going to have to be part of the, the process of achieving our, our desired outcomes. Then I looked up network, and network was described as a, a connected computers. <laughs> so, <laughs> or it was a verb, you know. Uh, interacting with folks, changing information so you could change your career, you know? So I was like, okay, let's not get sidetracked by the fact that we probably have to work together mm -hmm. to achieve our common purposes, mm -hmm. but we can, we can go into more depth on that. I do, I do want to, I've been given a few minutes, and I do want to take that few minutes to, to say to you that what we've been hearing about all day is the challenge of the belief in a hierarchy of human value. Now that's the way we talk about what manifests in our society as racism 
and other ways of creating the perceived other. Racism, or the belief in a hierarchy of human value, mm. it gave permission to relegate anyone that was perceived as different from the dominant group into an other category. But what's important is that that's part of the DNA of this country. When people talk about the first, second, and third reconstruction, what I'm reminded of is that we, re we never reconstructed mm. the fundamental belief <clears throat> upon which we built this nation. Mm -hmm. And that belief, unless we uproot it and transform it and replace it with another way of relating to one another as human beings, that belief will continue <clears throat> to manifest through oppressive systems. Now, we can change the systems, and we can modify the outcomes, and we can legislate, and we can litigate, but if we haven't changed the habit of mind, and that is what a belief it is, it's a habit of mind, it will continue to be manifest in our experience. The truth is we know enough about how the mind works today that we didn't know 100 years ago. We didn't know 200 years ago, we didn't know 300, we didn't ever know how the human mind operates and how stories become the basis of the human experience. Nor did we have the technology revolution that we have today to shape and fuel those stories. Our belief is that you can leverage where we are as a society today, and you can have a movement that has as its intention the uprooting and the replacing of that fundamental belief structure of a hierarchy of human value. And that's what the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Initiative, or mm -hmm. Enterprise, is about. We believe that it's time to shift our expectations about how we relate to one another as human beings. And once we envision that shift, that transformation, everything else has to change. We no longer have permission for this inequity and this inequality. <coughs> So my personal bias is that that fundamental shift has to undergird the transformations of the 21st century. Now, my question that I'm going to direct to Malika and to the other panelists, the question I was given was, what do we need today to forge a new civil rights movement that authentically, and this is one of the critical points here, that authentically contemplates, and I would say, and engages the lives of black, brown, and I'm going to add, because that hierarchy that I'm talking about, I mean, it's, it's embedded, you know. And so the way they constructed it back in the 1700s, it was white, black, brown, red, yellow. You, don't, you remember that, right? Some of us learned that in school. So when you start, because it was based on physical characteristics. It was based on physical appearance. So when you talk about this coalition and you say black and brown, you leave out Native American. You leave out probably Asian American, Pacific Islander. You leave out gender dynamics. You leave out queer and sexuality and the intersectionality of those things. So we have to recognize that it really is this, this sort of hierarchical frame, if you will, that some people have more value than others. So it's OK to marginalize them. And that's our challenge. But the question is, how do we create a coalition that integrates and intersects these different sort of categorical definitions of humanity in a way that moves us forward? Mm -hmm. So I will turn that first question over to Malika and to the panel in general. Well, I just want to give a piece of that answer, because I think that answer uh, deserves many different dimensions in its response. Um, and, and I will start by saying that I have a lot of belief and inspiration that I draw from the work that Black Lives Matter and other young 
black and brown folks are doing, where there is a language in a way that I have never heard before that is intersectional around identity, that it is not a singular identity, but a real grappling with, right? And it has to be a grappling, an exploration of, of many identities and being able to use the space of complex intersectional identities to forge a movement of justice. So I have a lot of belief in the millennials around how they are trying to, to come to terms and grapple with an authentic intersectional movement. But I want to add another piece here, which I think is important, um, which is the digital piece, right? And, and part of how I want us to think about and reimagine what a civil rights movement is, what movement building is in the 21st century, is to look at how are we able to advance a digital movement, right? And when you look at Black Lives Matter, and when you look at so much of what's happening, it has become digital. That it is, yes, about organizing in the streets and in the churches, but especially organizing online. And the power that has come out of this new expression of protest and analysis and mobilization, which is an online expression, that that is becoming more and more the new language of a new movement that I think we have to look at and honor. And it's also exciting to see with this an intersection that can happen around tech and opposition and human rights. So I look at how tech is allowing us all of these ways, all of these tools around human rights and civil rights. The smartphone that you hold in your hand, whether you hold that smartphone in Ferguson or Uganda is an opportunity to bear witness to abuses and to take that abuse and put it into the global conversation through social media. We did not have those tools before. And so how the story now is being told around police brutality is evidence of this powerful intersection between tech and human rights. Because of mostly young folk who have taken with their phones and demonstrated and was, were able to bear witness to police brutality and then share those images and use social media to be able to expose the truth, the pervasiveness of police brutality has reframed how this country now is talking about and coming to terms with police brutality. And that excites me because it is an opportunity to, as Brian Stevenson talks about so often, to be proximate. These tools of technology allow us to bear witness, to be proximate, and to, to demand justice in ways that we were not able to before. And I think the only other piece that I would want to add in, how do we talk about a reimagining, a re-envisioning of the civil rights coalition movement, human rights work ahead of us, is that, and I'm getting a real taste of this you know, at Google, tech is the new circle of power. And so much of how we talk about civil rights or human rights is about inclusion and access. The ways that we have fought hard for access to education, <coughs> to the right to vote, to fair housing. Now, the conversation has to be access and inclusion in the digital economy, in this new digital ecosystem, because it is a place of power that is becoming more powerful every day. So how are we creating pipelines into the tech industry? I think that's why Black Lives Matter is part of this conversation, right? Whose lives matter? so that when we see who is in tech, it is representative. Making sure that girls of color, boys of color, are learning how to code. Making sure that those who are in the leadership 
of the tech community are representative of black and brown communities. And ensuring and fighting for and seeking out how to be in constant dialogue with the tech community as people of color. And so part of what I have been trying to push forward as a human rights lawyer first and foremost is that digital rights are civil rights. Right? And so in the same way that we have been civil rights defenders, human rights defenders for inclusion and access, now we have to take that language and that rights-based framework and push it into the context of the digital economy, of the digital ecosystem, and fight for, demand, hold accountable our inclusion, our access to this new circle and place of power. Mm. Thank you very much, Malika. And, and you use the word power several times as you, as you described the challenge. And I think we all resonate with that. It's been, it's been throughout the day. <laughs> Other words that have been brought up in the interaction with the audience, a reminder of the importance of gender and intersectionality. And I'm going to uh, direct this next question to you, Jonathan. How does your project, Black Youth Project 100, build power by working through a black, queer, feminist lens. So Malika already started um, talking about the importance of identity and how this uh, new civil rights, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives, and the work that Black Youth Project is doing is trying to ask the question, who are we centering? Um, and how do we not make the mistake of pushing those populations that have consistently been invisible into the periphery, but how do we center those uh, voices in those communities? So that if I'm in Ferguson and all I hear is the name of black cis men, we have made the same mistake that we made 50 years ago. So how do we lift up the voices of trans black women that have been killed and brutalized and beaten by the police just as other populations of the black community? Um, so I would, I would absolutely say that our black, uh, black queer feminist lens is about who are we centering, how are we centering those communities, and how do we make sure that we're not leaving the voices of black women and trans people and queer people um, behind. I do want to come back to something. Th this dialogue, this conversation, this discourse about technology. Um, I'm 25. I, I grew up in the technological age. Um, I, I would consider myself technologically savvy. I think in the last year, um, there has been actually been a lot of caution uh, around our uses uh, of technology in the movement. Um, mm -hmm. This idea of surveillance, mm -hmm. the idea of privacy, the idea of who is watching us mm -hmm. now and who <laughs> was watching us then, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. Folks mm -hmm. are getting real nervous about this idea about relying so heavily on technology in so many ways to the point where we used to take our notes on Google Docs, we take our notes on paper now. <laughs> All right now. Um, so I think uh, <coughs> folks in, in movement yeah. spaces are really getting to a place uh, where we're trying to think yeah. about uh, protecting um, our, yeah. our privacy, protecting yeah. how yeah. we're entering into technological spaces, and really going back to the r number one rule of organizing, it is based on relationships. We need right. people yeah. to be in the same room talking yeah. to each other yeah. and building yeah. relationships yeah. based on radical love. Yeah. Um, and if, if that is not the, the central to our yes. analysis of organizing and movement building and how we're thinking yes. about power, um, then we're going to be standing 50 right. years from now looking at the same um, list yeah. of problems that we were dealing with 50 years ago. Um, I, I was uh, at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington um, t uh, back in 2013. And when you hear the list of issues they talk about, and I look to my comrades to my left and right, and it's the same list that we're mm. talking about today, what are we doing differently? How do we do something different that will be sustainable? Um, so in, in Black Youth Project 100, not only are we trying to make sure that we're centering the populations that are most marginalized and most left behind, but we're starting to think about how are we creating new systems that meet the lives of young black people. It cannot only be about reform anymore. 
we can't just be talking about reforming the same systems that were never made to meet the needs of black people to begin with, on down from criminal justice to foster care systems uh, to the education system. These systems are doing exactly what they were meant to do, oppress black people, silence black people, further oppress black people. And I think for the first time in a generation, we're getting to a place by the way, black, um, the, the um, Black Panther Party also believed in creating new systems uh -huh. that met the needs of black people. Mm -hmm. But we're really trying to think about how are we creating systems uh, that meet our need, that are radical, that are different, um, and that um, approach um, our lives with, 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 with love and care. All right. Well. Excellent. Thank you. Well said. Wade, I think. Um, this is a good segue into, I mean, you've had a lot of experience with coalitions of the last century. You've had a lot of work. <laughs> is that funny? At, at least the last century, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, this is the 21st century, and we, we lived through tw we much of the 20th. We started in the 20th. Okay, yeah. we started there. Hello. Yes. <laughs> About, it has been about coalition. So the question <laughs> is, what have we learned or what should we have learned? Uh -huh. How can we build more effective, better coalitions going forward? How do we better manage our relationships? You know, you were very brave for a long time in trying to manage these diverse relationships. Uh -huh. so, so what can you share with us okay. in terms of that <coughs> wisdom? Well, Gail, it's a great question. Uh, let me say I'd like to begin by trying to harmonize some of the comments that uh, Malika and Jonathan and you began with. I'd also like to say that recently I announced my retirement at the end of the year. So while I don't take it personally that I've been around for a full century, I certainly <laughs> feel that I've contributed my time and place. Uh, let me say first of all that you began by talking a little bit about your new responsibilities at Kellogg. And I will say that um, I have become convinced over time that we as a country, we are an ahistoric people. Yeah. Uh, we are not aware of the circumstances that gave birth to who we are today. And that until we have a meaningful process of truth and reconciliation, it is unlikely that we will create a foundation predicate for the kind of change that I think we'd all like to see happen. So I think that's number one. I think the United Nations has helped us by beginning last year to create the decade of African descendant people. It is an opportunity to bring forth ideas, programs, projects that help pave the foundation for truth and reconciliation. So just as one example, Malika mentioned Brian Stevenson, who is a dear friend and whom we're honoring this year at uh, our dinner. Uh, Brian is wonderful. But we're working with Brian and Sherilyn Eiffel, the new president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, to foster a project that would put name, plates, and identity at the places where African Americans have been lynched from 1870 to 1950. Mm -hmm. About 5,000 individuals mm -hmm. suffered that extraordinary uh, extrajudicial you know, homicide at the hands of uh, a power system that relegated them to this kind of netherworld of inequality. And we want to address that. And we think it will help to lay a foundation for the future. Excellent. So truth and reconciliation, <coughs> excuse me, is a part of the discussion. Secondly, I think Malika is right to the extent that technology has helped to create a global movement. A global movement. So when I issue a tweet, sometimes I get responses from Europe. Sometimes I get responses from Asia. <clears throat> it's amazing how many people read your Twitter feed. I also know that it is an excellent way of helping to organize communities in action. My first experience in that regard was Color of Change which used its command of technology to educate and motivate primarily a new generation to be concerned about uh, you know, things like Ferguson, but 
going way back to Louisiana and the struggles that we felt with. So it's important. Now, the Leadership Conference. The Leadership Conference is really the nation's oldest, largest, most diverse, leading civil and human rights coalition. We have over 200 national organizations, as we say, working to build an America as good as its ideals. Uh, but the truth is, guys, unless you are working in coalition, you are not practicing the politics to accomplish results in the 21st century. Hello. In the 21st century. And while coalitions are intended to be temporary uh, in nature, they, individuals and groups come together for a common purpose, our coalition was founded by giants of the civil and human rights movement in 1950. A. Philip Randolph, the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, first African-American labor leader. Roy Wilkins, who headed the NAACP, and Arnold Aronson, who was a leader of the National Jewish Community Relations Advisory Council. They understood the power of coalition. And while we started off advancing the interests of African Americans, today we have a representative body that includes literally every conceivable group that we can identify in the American polity, from Latinos and Asian Americans, from the LGBT community, from workers' interests, from women, uh, from religious leaders, children. Our coalition addresses the interests of a broad uh, category of, of organizations. Now, what have we learned? We have learned that the current system in our political space responds to issues of money and political power. Obviously, the money issue speaks for itself. It's gotten worse uh, since the Supreme Court uh, intervened uh, recently around issues of dark money. We know that that's a challenge, and we're going to have to address it. And we also recognize that in the space we are in today, very few of the groups that we seek uh, to empower have the kind of financial resources that would allow them to compete effectively in the political space we're talking about. But they do have numbers. We do have a diversity of demography that is taking place that is transforming this, nature, uh, this nation in powerful ways. And if we are able to harness that change, if we are able to educate ourselves about the applied use of power, then we can have tremendous impact. And so some of that uh, power is tied uh, to the political space that far too few of us fully avail ourselves of. Every vote, look, voting is the language of democracy, guys. It's true. If you don't vote, you don't count. Every vote that we do not make is a vote in favor of the opposition <coughs> that would keep us down and in place. So harnessing the voting potential of the current generation in power, but also tapping into the new millennials who are making change that at this time is not tied directly to an exercise of voting power, but can only be accomplished through a reinforcement of that voting power is something that we have to uh, avail ourselves of. So here's my last point. When I look at places like Ferguson or Baltimore or Chicago, and see that the Black Lives Matter movement, Black Youth Project, and others have been successful in removing three police chiefs who have been responsible for some of Wait the worst that practices, that right? <laughs> that have taken place across the country. Let's give credit where it's due. Absolutely. These young people, taking a page from the youth movement of the past, have helped to really bring about change in important ways. But reinforcing that change requires engagement in the electoral system that many have shunned. So when you look at who did vote and didn't vote in Ferguson, and you realize that so many of us were left out of that system, having lasting change requires an engagement and a harnessing of that power in the most direct way. And I think those are elements of change that have to be brought to bear if we are going to be successful in moving beyond where we are today to this new, more enlightened era that we'd like to see come about in the 21st century. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.
Mimoa, the question I have for you, I know you're a pragmatist of the first order, and the question is, are ideas, innovation, good public policy enough to achieve an urban civil rights agenda? I, um, I, I think Jonathan um, has a right that 50 years later, we can look on our right and our left and say, we're still talking about the same things. Um, and so as a way to answer that question is, if good ideas, innovation, and public policy um, um, could move us forward, then 50 years later, we wouldn't still be saying, we're still talking about the same thing, right? Um, as as, as good-hearted as we all are in this room, uh, as fire, fired up and fiery uh, and passionate as we are uh, about doing the work that we do, um, we oftentimes underestimate the external forces that act to disrupt and derail the work that we need to do. And I think that you know, one way to sort of um, uh, tie in some of the comments that have been uh, made up here and in other panels throughout the day is that um, I, I, I am an optimist and I am so excited. I am so excited about the current era. I know that we're all a little bit down in the dumps about the current political landscape. But, but I, I am so excited about the current movement. And um, I, I consider myself young. Um, and the majority of us in this room consider ourselves young at heart um, because we still have that fire in our belly. And um, we can still get out there and get down with our brothers and sisters who are on the front line doing this work. Um, but what's so exciting about this moment is that we have leaders, and I'm not going to say young leaders. I'm just saying that we have leaders who are emerging under the reality of our multicultural United States of America. I have relatives who don't all look like me. When my family show up for a family picnic, we all look like all of us in this room. That's the reality of the world we live in, and that's the reality of our leaders today as they're engaging in this work. And so as Jonathan's talking about the intersectionality of the lens and the frame that they're doing their work, that kind of leadership is what we need to actually bring in the innovation creativity to be able to derail the disruptive forces that are forcing us right, to be in this paralysis space. So let me be a little bit more concrete. I think, uh, I, I've been a very frustrated professional Asian. <laughs> this is the first time in my life where I have been an Asian American, working with an Asian American organization, being told that I can only speak on behalf of Asian Americans. But you all know, I come from a space of being an elected official. And I'm one of the few people that there is some honor to that task, and that I'm kind of earnest that there is a certain responsibility and obligation that comes from that. And for the 10 years that I was in office, I fought against being pigeonholed as the Asian senator in the Minnesota State Senate. And I have brought that passion with me into this, this position where, where I feel like I'm being told and being asked and expected to be a professional Asian. And I'm sharing that with you as an example that my sense of frustration is reflective of our reality, that that's not the world that we all represent, and that's not the world that we live in. That's not the world that Jonathan is doing his work in, and that's not the kind of leadership that is going to <coughs> take us into the future as we think about the civil rights agenda. Right? So when I talk to some of my colleagues who are doing this work on the ground, and we talk about what does freedom mean, or what does solidarity mean? You know, and there's some deep thinking around the idea of solidarity, right? because solidarity is, is the glue to coalition work in order for us to move forward. And, and oftentimes, when you get right down to it, is the ability to walk in somebody's shoes, is the ability to emotionally connect at the very human level, right, where differences disappear. And that's how we own each other's oppression, and that's how we co-own each other's solutions, 
And that's how we can co-create solutions that go beyond just black or white or Asian or Native American. So that multi culty right, the multicultural, multiracial, multi-lens leadership is what we need and it's what we need to exert in order for us to craft a civil rights agenda and in order to move into a future of a coalition that is not just bring together a group of Asian folks into the mix or a group of Latino folks into the mix, but it's actually bring together individuals who are multicultural, multiracial, and how they represent particular interests to be part of a coalition. All right, thank you, Lenore. So, you know, we've been doing a lot of talking about, and so given that we're talking about the coalition, the Civil Rights Coalition of the Future, I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask you to show me and not tell me. Show us and not tell us. You, you did some of that just now, all of you did. <coughs> in the time that we have before we go to questions, I'm gonna ask you to walk us into a, an authentic experience, right? A successful model, if you will, or just your own experience mm. of this effective coalition or this effective network or this effective leveraging of the technology. Uh, we want people to walk out of here inspired and believing that it's possible. So I'm gonna ask you if you could, and I know you didn't expect this, I'm throwing this at you, uh, to say, you know, to tell us, show us, don't tell mm -hmm. us, show us something that demonstrates the real possibility of success in this new way. And, and, and I'm also gonna ask you all to be tolerant and forgiving because everyone sort of starts from where they are and so, at least three times today, I've had this moment of offense, personally, mm. you know, when someone has said, it's not just black and white. And when they say that, in my head, I realize they're minimizing, potentially, the significance of black and white, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are a transgender person, if you are a female and you're hearing all about men, you know, if you are... Um, Asian American and they're not enough visibility, if you're Latino, Mexican American and that's not here, if you're white and, and you realize that your voice isn't being heard. You know, so it's easy to be in these spaces and take personal offense, but if we're gonna move forward, we get a moment for that and we gotta move forward. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm just asking you all to share, if you will, from your own experience, the reality or an illustration or a story of how does how do we really do this? Hmm. I'll kick it off. I mean, it, it's hard work. It's a tough question, and again, it's one that uh, I certainly didn't anticipate, but let me struggle with it. Um, I think there are two examples that I might use to highlight the importance of coalition activity, both uh, intergenerational coalition activity on the one hand, and multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition as well. The first uh, really is reflected of a meeting that I attended last week at the White House uh, with, Pre with President Obama, with Attorney General Loretta Lynch, a high-level group of White House officials, and an intergenerational group of civil rights activists, primarily from the African-American community, but it was the first intergenerational meeting of its kind at the White House, and in that sense, it was historic. The focus was to talk about criminal justice policy and how we could go about the business of implementing what is now a pending piece of legislation supported by a Republican group on the right and a progressive civil rights group on the left focused on sentencing reform. There's a good chance that we can get it. It builds on something President Obama helped lead in 2010 with the Fair Sentencing Act that reduced penalties between crack and powder cocaine, the disparities between the two. More work needs to be done. This new bill would apply those provisions retroactively and incorporate a number of people who obviously deserve release. We had a conversation about encouraging the president to use his clemency power more generously than he has chosen thus far. And we talked about specific reforms, some included in the bill, some not, focused on police actions. What was interesting is that some of the heat of this coalition was driven by young millennials who are in the street, whether it's Black Lives Matter or its variations. 
And some of it was driven by experienced civil rights activists who are engaged with Congress on actually doing the work to implement a bill. And as I said, it was unique in its structure, but the fact that you had uh, both uh, uh, this intergenerational mix, mm -hmm. I thought was unique and worthy of recognition. The other example that I would use is the effort to repair the damage done by the Supreme Court on the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Coalition is a multi-racial, multi-ethnic coalition that recognizes the power of the vote and its importance to progressive causes that we share in common. We have an effort to try to enact a new Voting Rights Advancement Act that would repair the damage done by the Supreme Court and actually strengthen the Voting Rights Act in several material ways. We are focused in organizing in states where members are in cycle. So Ohio with Senator Portman and Illinois with Senator Kirk and Wisconsin with Senator Johnson. And without going through too much of that, we are tapping the strengths and powers of this incredibly diverse coalition and helping to advance our goals on the ground. Because we recognize that if we don't have the uh, vote available to us, and by the way, this is the first federal election in 50 years where we will not have had the full protection of the Voting Rights Act. And it's not simply about suppressing every vote uh, that can be suppressed uh, to have the other side win. It's about shaving off a small percentage, one or two percentages in key races that make all the difference all in, the the world. Difference in the world. So uh, those are two examples of what I think are very important coalitions that are struggling for success. And as I think Jonathan pointed out, relationships are key. And so you have to build the level of trust and common interest. And you have to demonstrate how each partner in the coalition will benefit in some material way mm -hmm. by the success of the entire effort. And those, I think, are lessons Those are, to, to those are good insights. Anybody else on the panel want to share an act? Yes, Malika? Um, I'll give two as well. And I, I think it's important to give from, from both worlds, right? So from the, the private sector space I am perched in now, and, and then before that, the NGO space. Um, I had a very powerful experience of uh, watching Brian Stevenson at Google. So Google made the commitment last year to do a racial justice initiative and gave two million out in grants to racial justice and criminal justice reform organizations, uh, one of them being to Patrice Cullors of Black Lives Matter. And uh, last week announced another three million commitment to um, racial justice and criminal justice reform organizations, and, and including Brian Stevenson. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we do is every Thursday, the employees in Mountain View, the headquarters, come together with um, Larry and Sergey, Larry Page and Sergey Bran, um, and it's live streamed to, um, to all 60,000 employees of Google. And so Brian's speech was the focus. Um, and it was powerful to hear him talk about racial justice in the context of the Google community and to hear him give voice to and name the issue of how slavery hasn't changed, it's just morphed. Because I think it's powerful to have those conversations in those spaces. It's not necessarily coalition building as you're speaking, but it is the idea of creating these places of connection and intersection that we need in order to have justice. Malika, I, I'm being guided that we have to move on to the questions, but what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you could perhaps interweave your second story. Very, very quickly. Into one of the, absolutely. Okay, okay. Um, I uh, had the honor of putting a report together called um, Girls Behind Bars, The Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline. And it was a wonderful opportunity not to counter the school to prison pipeline, not to counter and mitigate the narrative of boys being pipelined into the criminal justice system, 
but to say we must expand the narrative to include girls and to understand the distinct ways that our black and brown girls are being criminalized for their experiences of sexual abuse and to see the way the civil rights community, the women's community joined us and raised up that narrative was a powerful moment of coalition. Thank, thank you so much. So we're, I've been, we're now gonna turn to questions from the audience and given that it's the end of the day, I am gonna ask you to ask questions. <laughs> Good, that was subtle, but you got it. <laughs> so do we have, the mics are around or do we have any questions? Or? That's always a good sign when you don't, but go ahead. Hi. 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 My name is Kenesha Grant. I am a professor of political science at Howard. Um, I'm also a millennial, and I teach millennials. And I hear often from them and in conversations with people about them that they feel as though the older generation of folks in the struggle are not ready to leave yeah. the mantle and don't trust them with that. So I want to know what you think about that. Um, I want to know whether you have observed that mm -hmm. and whether they are making a valid assumption. I assume that you all are not of that ilk, but <laughs> I want to know what you oh. think about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm oh. going to let uh, um, any other panelists respond. Uh, anybody have a response to that? Okay, I have wait. a response, but I don't want to, you yeah. know, right. cry so. about others. Look, let me be quick, guys. I did announce that I'm leaving at the end of the year. <laughs> and, and let me say why it's important. I announced in part because I believe it's time to bring a new generation of leadership to the helm of the coalition I had. I started 20 years ago. Okay. I was in the middle of my 40s then. I'm obviously not in the middle of my 40s now. The point that I'm making is that if you don't create space for new leadership, it won't emerge. Now, part of the problem, and I think the comment of your millennial students is accurate to a point. Part of why these vacancies are not as uh, open as one might hope or are not as regularly presented as they should be is because many of the people in those positions of leadership have nowhere to go. It is not as if they have earned substantial incomes over the course of their lives they are now in the senior realm of their leadership. They bring great strengths to the table, but they also, like the rest of us, think about what they do and their professional work. And it is a challenge uh, to find individuals who will voluntarily step away from these jobs and to create space for others. We are hopeful that we are helping to set a precedent for how organizations in the progressive and NGO space can help to accomplish that result. But I think there's a little bit of truth to what your students say, and we have to find new ways of promoting that leadership and growing it so that the next generation is ready to take over and to do the great work that they are already beginning to demonstrate. I would want to applaud um, Miles Rappaport, who was president of Demos. Mm -hmm. In, in, in modeling, if you will, that you know he could step aside and mm -hmm. make space for a millennial to step in and lead. Mm -hmm. And I think, but he had somewhere to go. Now, and Miles else. was, a, <laughs> exactly. Yes, this he is did. a white Jewish male who had somewhere to go. Yes, he did. You know? And so we do need to bring that understanding and that nuance into the discussion. Mm -hmm. It's very real that many of our leaders of my generation, they, they don't have a, another ramp, if you will. They don't have a university to go to and be a, a fellow or a chair. It's something philanthropy might think about in Absolutely. terms of how we help to make that more, more likely to happen. Uh, but I would, I would love to hear other comments in response to that. I'll answer that and I'll answer the last question. Um, uh, I always think back to, to being in Ferguson uh, and Jesse Jackson takes the stage and young people there literally shouting him off the stage saying, not again, we will not yet again have another uh, traditional civil rights movement trying to take over this movement, call it their own. Um, I think uh, young people aren't looking for another black charismatic male leader. That's not what this movement will look like. Um, 
so I think that young people absolutely are struggling um, to find mentorship in ways from, from, from um, traditional civil rights, <laughs> rights leaders, but also space. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, we've just created our own spaces. We've started new organizations, uh, and we're leading um, a, a fresh new movement now. Uh, but I think absolutely, like we we are trying to look up to folks who have came before us for for mentorship and advice. Uh, but sometimes that space isn't created at all. Um, I will also talk about a, a little bit just about uh, how Black Youth Project is entering into coalitional building spaces. Um, as my sweatshirt says, we, we are unapologetically black. We, we make no qualms about that. Uh, and we are trying to spend our time organizing uh, young black people uh, to be organizers, to, do, to enter into direct action organizing, advocacy, education. Um, and as we're doing that, um, it was October 24th, uh, 2015, our first massive civil rights, uh, ma massive civil disobedience that we undertook. Um, it was black led, it was black women led, uh, we were strategic, um, and in that moment basically we uh, shut down the International Conference of Chief of Police. Uh, we shut down the surrounding streets, we shut down the highway, I was inside the building chained into the walkway at McCormick Center. Um, so that's the type of radical action that's taking place with young people, but there's also a coalition aspect of that. Uh, one, Black Youth Project understands that we, are, we cannot build power alone. Um, it is important to work with other coalitional groups to do that. So Dreamers partnered with us to do that in Chicago. Uh, there were folks from the API community that partnered with us to do that, but it was still Black-led. We were still talking about the criminalization of Black people in Chicago, and we didn't feel like we had to sacrifice that in order to enter into spaces that were intentionally and unapologetic about uh, building strong coalitions that fight against power. Uh, one more point about how we did that. Uh, there were trans and gender nonconforming people, a part of the, the group that, uh, of folks who uh, we called them, them red. They were willing to go to jail and went to jail in Chicago that day. We were strategic in having conversations about, okay, well, if you're arrested as a trans person or as a gender nonconforming person, how do we protect you in that situation? How do we support you in that situation? So not just think thinking about um, centering black people, building coalitions with other races, but also what are the other identities that come into that space that we have to be intentional uh, as we're building power. Mm -hmm. And different meanings, absolutely. I'm going to um, do my moderator's job and invite another question, and I'm going to try to direct it to Mimoa to respond, whatever it is. So, oh. <laughs> Do we have another question, right. Mike? I think I have the mic here. Okay. Thank you. Right, right here. Um, do I have to stand up? Okay, I'm sorry. All right, first of all, no. thanks, it's been a great panel. Um, this question in many ways kind of builds also off of Jonathan, but throughout the day, people have talked about this being such an important and incredible moment. And part of what folks have talked about is the significance of this being different because maybe we're working through a framework of intersectionality. But you know, when I think about things like, and this is not an attack, but uh, <laughs> about videos and smartphones, and the kind of democratic nature of that. We mm -hmm. still generally mobilize around the images of black men being mm -hmm. brut brutalized by the police, right? And there are certain forms of attack that more readily kind of mm -hmm. resonate with us and that we are able to mobilize around. So I'm just wondering how each of you, or uh, one or two of you, might talk about the centrality of intersectionality and a new way of thinking about mobilization and kind of moving mm -hmm. urban agendas forward. Who has to be at the center? <coughs> Who has to be a part of the leadership? You know, what are the issues and how are they different when we center other people? Okay. Well, um, since Gail said that I should take a stab at it, <laughs> I, I think that it builds on the model that Jonathan just talked about, whether it, I mean, whether it was intended for it to be a model or not, right? I mean, I think that, that um, if you look at the landscape today and what's happening is that we, we are seeing instances of, you know, black men uh, being murdered. We're seeing Muslim, you know, men and women being murdered, right? We're seeing different, different um, uh, individuals in our community going through these types of different experiences. And so out of those experiences, we need to create the space for the communities who are most affected <laughs> for their own healing and for their own um, sense of efficacy to be able to own, uh, personally own that fight 
But as Gail has said, the ownership of it is not an exclusive ownership. It is an, it, it is an, an invitation and a need and actually a cry for a broader coalition for others to come in and be a part of that conversation. Now, I come from a community, and I don't mean to, to, to not want to represent the Asian American community. My community deserves somebody as fierce as me uh, to be their voice. And so I proudly, proudly take on that mantle. Um, but you know, we are one of the most invisible, one of the most often forgotten in the discourse around what is taking place in this country. And so we're always, always in need of coalition in order for us to be able to even be at the table. So we understand the value of coalition. But when something happens in our community, we alone don't have the number or the strength to be able to sometimes stand up for ourselves. And so we need the coalition. We need our partners and our allies to give us that space to own that issue. But we also need you all to show up and say, but we're standing right there with you, giving you our strength. And so that's been our experience in our community. And I think that Jonathan has it right. Um, and that what's happening you know, on the ground with our leaders on the ground, um, that's why the AAPI kids showed up. Because the AAPI kids aren't just AAPI kids. They're also dreamers. Right. And they're also in the trans community. right? I mean, they have these multiple identities that expresses themselves in different environments and different places. But sometimes, one person carries all of those identities. Mm -hmm. Right, that chooses to be expressed in those leadership moments. So we've been given the five minute warning, so I'm gonna ask this to be the final remarks from the panelists mm. as we go through. So Malika, I think you're next. So I would just say that, that you know, we're in a place of transition, right? So the new narrative has not taken root. So that's still when women of color are centered, it doesn't have the same traction as when African-American men are centered around issues of abuse and brutality. But I have to say that, you know, I, I heard um, Patrice talk about um, how this movement is anti-misogynistic, is about being anti-patriarchal and being queer. And I was stunned that those words were said. It is not the, it is not the trope of organizing that I came out of. So we are in a place of transition where this new narrative is beginning to emerge. And in that place, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have talked about or seen a Sandra Blonde, but now we do. 10 years from now, when she or someone who is brutalized as a black woman is given voice, she will be centered, because then that narrative will have taken root. And so I think the, the promise here is that we are on shifting grounds, but what is before us, I think, promises to be so much more for my children, that I know my daughter will be centered in this movement that her life matters more than my life has been valued, and certainly those who came before us. Mm -hmm. Well said. Do we have a final word from <coughs> any of the other yeah. panelists? I'm sorry, can I, I, I interrupt? I apologize. I wanted just to, I wanted to thank you. I just wanna thank all of you, and I wanted to say, this is so important with coalition building, is how you're taking care of yourselves. I, I hope that because you're you're putting your bodies on the line every day, and we all are. I want to thank all of us. We're putting our bodies on the line every day. I just want to ask how you're caring for yourself and each mm. other in coalition building. Well, look, it's a it's a great question, and I want to tie it back to to the question on the table. Look, guys, we have a very simple motto in the coalition that I had, which is if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. If you want a friend, you have to be a friend. And if you are looking to build relationships that form coalitions, and our coalition will remain in place until equality has been achieved right. broadly for us all. So, you know, it's going to take longer than the 60 years we've been in existence. It will take much longer, but it is possible. So here's what I would say. When the African-American community takes the lead in mobilizing efforts around the Voting Rights Act, and when we get support from the Latino and Asian community, 
the progressive community generally, it is because there is a recognition that voting is the right of us all and we need to engage to accomplish our results. But it helps to bring support as well uh, for the dreamers and for the recipients of DACA and DAPA, the uh, you know, relief for people who have been here for a long time. So when I'm standing at the Supreme Court, with African-American leaders in the National Council of Churches and with the AFL-CIO, protesting and encouraging the Supreme Court to grant certiorari in the case of USB Texas, it's because we want to show that as black people, immigration is not just a Latino issue, it's an issue that affects the entire country. And when we come out and support workers who are struggling for $15 an hour, or maybe same day, day laborers, who are trying to get resources, it's because we recognize the common interest that we share. It is important for us to put on a broader lens than the individual communities that we represent, to take into account how we can forge relationships that produce the long-term results that we are struggling to accomplish. And I think if we do that with more uh, uh, you know, attention, we can be more effective. So I'm gonna ask Jonathan and Mimola just quick last words. Uh, yeah, um, Black Youth Project has uh, started to participate in radical healing um, led by, by black women, uh, to be clear. Um, so we come with so much trauma uh, in movement spaces that often uh, clashes with each other within our movement. Um, so for us, it's not only a requirement to be intersectional, it's not only a requirement for us to think about the compounding effects of how our identities come into the room, um, it's not only a requirement for us to think anti-patriarchal and anti-misogynistic, um, but it's a requirement for us to participate in radical forms of healing. Um, and, and we're coming out with a healing manual that's being written right now, so we're thinking a lot about um, how are we taking care of ourselves, how are we working through our black queer feminist lens to do that? Um, and how do we make sure that we're centering the, the communities and the populations uh, that have been truly disadvantaged and oftentimes left behind? So I'm a political refugee child from the mountains of Laos. You know, I came to this country at the age of nine and we left everything and everybody we knew behind. Um, and so my formula to how I do my work is that as a refugee, I've had to survive, and the way that I've survived and thrived is to make family wherever I go, to make community wherever I go. And my first test of making family and making community is to make sure that I open my home and my life to the people around me so that they so, are so intimately engaged in my life that they see my experience as their own They've tasted my food. They've ingested my spices, <laughs> right? They've drank in my home. And unless and until we're able to do that with each other at that such human level, that sense of empathy and that sense of co-ownership of each other's future and each other's prosperity, right? It won't be that real. It may be just be transactional for convenient purposes as opposed to an emotional commitment to a collective future. So. As we draw this amazing moment to a close, and it has been an amazing day, and it has been an amazing panel, I would just leave you with this thought. This idea of having built a nation on a belief system that devalues people, that creates a hierarchy of value, it is organized lovelessness. It is permission to not love. And we hear it today in the political debate. But remember that it was in play and developed and honed for four consecutive centuries. And so one of the things that this moment is allowing us to better understand is the centrality of the capacity to love one another as human beings as part of one human family. When Dr. King talked about the beloved community, it was about that. It was about our capacity. But you can't give what you don't have. So the sister's comment about how are we taking care of ourselves is at the heart of it. I cannot extend love to you if I don't feel love for me. So to be unapologetically black or any other identity 
is a manifestation of self-love, which is a requirement for extending that love versus projecting less than or hatred of the other. So I think this is an unprecedented moment. The polling data tells us it's an unprecedented moment. And the, the diversity of this room generationally and every other way makes me believe that we have the courage to step into this moment and achieve more than any generations behind us may have to date. Yeah, yeah. So thank you all very, very much. And thank you.